I want to thank everyone today for uh, joining us at this month's meeting of the Ledge Branch Capacity Working Group, where we'll be discussing the new book, Congress Overwhelm, the Decline in Congressional Capacity and Prospects for Reform. Uh, this is a book that I think many of you will know. It covers ideas that have been long addressed and supported by our street, and we're excited to have all three of our editors uh, with us today. But um, before we get going, I'd like to introduce and, and thank a number of people first. Um, you know, first, I'd like to uh, point out that this, this month's event is being hosted by, uh, co-hosted with American University and specifically with the, uh, the programs on uh, legislative negotiation, the Sign Institute of Policy and Politics, and the AU Center for Congressional and Presidential Studies in the School of Public Affairs. So I'd like to thank them all very much for their, their sponsorship of this event. Um, and before I introduce our, our panelists, I'd also like to introduce our, our, our moderator for today's event from American University, uh, Professor Bettina Poirier. Uh, Professor Poirier is the director of American University's program on legislative negotiation and is an adjunct professor at the Washington College of Law. She's also a fellow at the Center for Congressional and Presidential Studies. She previously served as staff director and chief counsel for the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee for over 10 years. She was the first woman to hold this position in the committee's history, uh, where she worked for Senator Barbara Boxer, the chair and later ranking member. She also served as a legislative assistant uh, and later as senior counsel to Senator Boxer with a stint in between as minority counsel to the House Energy and Commerce Committee under ranking member John Dingell. Uh, she is a graduate of the New York University School of Law and began her legal career as an environmental associate. Uh, thank you again, uh, Tina, for moderating today's discussion. And uh, now just take a few minutes to introduce our three panelists, the editors of Congress Overwhelmed. Uh, Lee Gottman is a senior fellow in the political reform program at the New America Foundation and the author of uh, the, the book Breaking, Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop, The Case for Multi-Party Democracy in America and the Business of America is Lobbying. Uh, this later work was the winner of the 2016 American Political Science Association's Robert A. Dahl Award, given for scholarship of the highest quality on the subject of democracy. Dr. Drutman is also the co-host of the podcast Politics in Question, uh, and he writes for the New York Times, Vox, 538, among other outlets. He holds a PhD in political science from the University of California, uh, Berkeley, and a BA from Brown University. So thank you for joining us, Lee. Uh, Dr. Timothy Lapira uh, is a professor of political science at James Madison University and faculty affiliate at the Center for Effective Lawmaking at the University of Virginia. His expertise is on Congress, interest groups, and lobbying, and in addition to Congress Overwhelmed, uh, his books include Revolving Door Lobbying, Public Service, Private Influence, and the Unequal Representation of Interests. Dr. Lapira also serves on the editorial board for the academic journals Legislative Studies Quarterly and Interest Groups and Advocacy. He previously worked on Capitol Hill uh, as a fellow at the House Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress and as a legislative assistant in the 1990s. Dr. Lapira has also been a researcher at the Center for Responsive Politics, where he was responsible for developing the lobbying and revolving door databases uh, on opensecrets.org. So thank you for joining us, Timothy. Uh, and finally, last but certainly not least, uh, is Dr. Kevin Kozar, uh, a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, where he studies U.S. Congress, uh, congressional oversight, the administrative state, uh, American politics, and the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, Dr. Kozar was previously at the R Street Institute, where he served as vice president of policy, vice president of research partnerships, and senior fellow and director of our governance program, uh, my predecessor. Uh, as many of you know, he also co-founded and co-directs the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group. Uh, prior to his time at R Street, Dr. Kozar spent more than a decade working for the Congressional Research Service, where he focused on a wide range of public administration issues. He's taught public policy at NYU and lectured on public administration at Metropolitan College of New York. Uh, his books also include Unleashing Opportunity, Policy Reforms for an Accountable Administrative State, Moonshine, A Global History, Ronald Reagan and Education Policy, uh, Whiskey, A Global History, I'm noticing a trend, uh, Filling Grades, The Federal Politics of Education Standards, and Bridging the Gap, Higher Education and Career-Centered Welfare Reform. Uh, Dr. Kozar hosts a doctorate uh, and a master's in politics from NYU. So uh, thank you so much, Kevin. And uh, with that, I think I'll turn it over to Professor Poirier so we can get our program started. Uh, thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, I really appreciate that introduction and kicking off our program. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to discuss a timely and important new book, Congress Overwhelmed. We have the editors with us today, as you heard, Tim Lapira, Lee Drutman, and Kevin Kosar, Kosar. And I wanna start by probably stating the obvious, which is there's very little agreed upon in Washington at this point in time. 
but there is general agreement that the challenges faced by Congress are substantial and frankly observe, uh, deserve our immediate and focused attention. Polarization and partisanship are the headlines and recent events have underscored the deep divisions on Capitol Hill. At the same time, there is reason to be hopeful that progress can be made on the Hill and this book provides many thoughtful insights on where some of the problems come from, along with ideas and solutions that can lead to a more effective problem solving legislative branch. Um, I am optimistic about the future, despite the, the perils that we are currently facing. And I come from this viewpoint um, based on experience on Capitol Hill. And as you heard previously, I worked 15 years on Capitol Hill and left the Hill in 2017. So my experience is a fairly recent vintage and partisanship and polarization were a key part of that experience. But we also got a fair amount done. And I hope to bring a little bit of those insights to you all in our discussion today. Uh, I'm going to start by posing a question to each panelist, and this is the question. You all come from very different backgrounds, but you came together on this project with a common purpose, to closely study why Congress appears to be so overwhelmed and to identify possible solutions to this serious issue. Can you each share with us why you were drawn to this project and the perspective you brought to the effort given your unique history and experience? And I'll start with Kevin. Sure. Um, well, uh, as mentioned in my bio, I spent uh, a little more than a decade working at the Congressional Research Service. And there I worked with hundreds of staff, uh, along with legislators, both you know, personal office committees, on a whole host of issues of interest to Congress, everything from looking up the simplest facts for them to, you know, doing deep in the weeds oversight stuff, helping them, you know, identify witnesses for hearings and write questions and even testifying myself. And one of my big takeaways from 11 years on the Hill was how broadly felt was this sense of frustration and disappointment and a feeling uh, of kind of a learned helplessness where you have lots of staff, lots of legislators looking around saying, this is not really what I signed up for. Why do things have to be this way? Why is it so hard to do the simplest things down here? Not even legislative stuff, like simple stuff, like can we use this room in Rayburn or something? Why do we have to go through so many hoops and struggles? And it was jarring to me because as we all know, Congress has the authority to organize itself just about however it pleases, and it can fund itself as much as it wants. And yet here it was kind of suffering a collective action problem of everybody's miserable, but nobody can get together and do something. And that kind of laid the origins for putting together the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group. And it also um, set the course for us to, you know, be here today to have this book. Um, we've all been writing about this topic in so many different ways and formats and such. And, but there was no book out there that kind of summed up like, here's the research on various facets of capacity and here's, here's what we should know and understand about that. That book just hadn't been done. And uh, that's, you know, that's how we got here. And that's why, that's, why, uh, that's why I got involved in doing this. But let me pass the baton to the other guys. So Tim, uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, I think my experience started here it was my very first job out of college was working for a member of Congress um, in a district office. During, uh, it seems like generations ago, during the Clinton impeachment, and which I would, I recall showing up to work in the morning and the phone would not stop ringing until I left uh, for the day. It was back when I used to have to literally shove the phone in the drawer just to go get lunch. And um, and from that, uh, of course, I was able to achieve nothing else that, that I was responsible for on behalf of my boss. And notice that neither were any of my colleagues in the office or even the boss himself, right? That, that we were, he was quite literally overwhelmed, right? And um, not long into that experience, he asked me to move down to Washington and became a legislative assistant in his personal office, um, in which my very first week, I was sitting on the dais in the uh, uh, Energy and Commerce Committee room uh, um, 
in, engaged in a markup for an extremely complicated piece of legislation that the 23 year old me at the time had no business being there, had no expertise, had no uh, uh, information, had no basic talking points about uh, uh, this ended up being, by the way, the Graham Lee Spliley National Modernization Act of 1999. And I could barely at the time balance my checkbook, let alone explain complex uh, uh, derivatives and, uh, uh, and, and how multiple agencies regulate financial transactions in, in the United States. And not only did, did I uh, sort of introspectively uh, come to, to, to terms with the fact that I, I, I felt so very un, unqualified, I realized that many folks around me uh, um, were very much in the same position. Uh, and it, it became very apparent to me that, that Congress's job is extremely complex. It's not just that the government has grown over time, it's that our policies, the world around us, our society and our economy has become so incredibly complex that what we typically do, or what Congress typically is doing is, is a bit of whack-a-mole trying to solve one problem at a time uh, um, and never really reaching any, any, any sort of conclusion. Fast forward a bit, I, I go on to my, my graduate education and uh, um, begin my research in, in trying to look at uh, um, lobbyists and what became my first book, uh, Revolving Door Lobbying with Herschel Thomas. And what we found, what, you know, the, the initial story going into this, the, this research was, well, folks with Capitol Hill experience or experience in, in the White House or the upper levels of a federal agency, um, they're really selling uh, their access to, to, to others. And then digging around, I realized that's, that wasn't exactly it, right? Um, certainly access is important, but really what mattered more was quite literally the on the ground experience, working in the, uh, late at night with leaf rolled up, notepad, trying to figure out what is the plan of trying to solve this problem. Even when there is general agreement that there is a problem and that there are viable solutions to that problem, there are still so many uh, 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 organizational and behavioral mechanisms that need to come together all at the same time to make, make these, these things happen. And it takes an enormous amount of experience and expertise to be able to work through those weeds and we're not even entering into the complexities of the differences between the House and the Senate and, uh, and then dealing with the White House uh, preferences and at any given time. And like many others, and as we, part of what, what one of the findings in the, in the book show, I ended up staying there for just a handful of years, uh, I'm a, a, essentially a Congress and a half. Uh, Professor Perea, you're unusual in that you spent 15 years at it. That's a super staffer, right? It's, uh, very much on the tail end. Uh, the average staffer stays there about three and a half years, uh, um, if that. And, and most staffers uh, uh, in a recent study, or extended study that, that underlies the book, we, we found that 75% you know, of staff on Capitol Hill are under 40. Makes, partly makes me feel very old. Uh, um, and and uh, that none of that is to say that, that the individual staff are not capable uh, in, in doing their job, but uh, and they're, they're not bright and highly motivated, um, but they they work in a space, in a place where they're not where their talents and their knowledge and their expertise is not really fully taken advantage of. So um, we we've known for a while that that this ha has been a problem, and it would sort of underlie uh, the, the research I did in my first book. And then I saw uh, uh, Kevin and Lee put together this group. Uh, um, uh, the legislative branch working group, and and one of, uh, and one of the, the occasions I happened to not be teaching, so I uh, uh, made my way into D.C. and attended, and uh, um, um, pulled the fellows aside afterwards and said, you know, we, we really should do a a, a large systematic pro project in order to really marshal the evidence um, of what we at least anecdotally know, and so then we can say, in in, in a much better way. How big is the problem? Uh, what exactly is the extent uh, of, of, of these problems? And only then, I think, you know, with evidence, can we really start having a conversation uh, um, about political reform? So uh, um, that's how I got here. Uh, um, and I'll pass it off to, to Lee. Well, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate that. By the way, I went to Capitol Hill when I turned 40. So I think I turned all the models on, on their head. 
but I'll share what that was like because obviously it was different than the young staffers coming up. But Lee, can you add uh, your perspective to this? Yeah, sure. So um, I, I wrote a, my, my uh, book on lobbying, the business of America uh, is lobbying, was based on interviews with lots and lots of lobbyists. And one of the things that I kept hearing when I would talk to lobbyists, they would say, well, Congress needs us because we help them figure out what it is they want to do. Uh, and, you know, you know like, yeah. You know, I mean, sure, maybe maybe if a few lobbyists said that, that would sound like arrogance, but like that was something that I heard some version of over and over again. And oh, I, I quickly realized that this was actually the case. Uh, and you know, I talked to people in Congress, and you know, it was confirmed from their end. And then I went uh, and decided I'd see for myself, and I became. Uh, congressional fellow through the American Political Science Association. Um, I worked in a Senate Democratic office during the uh, writing of the Dodd-Frank bill. And uh, so like, like Tim, I was thrust into financial policy uh, and, you know, not, not an expert in financial policy, but here I was, you know, advising a Democratic senator on the Senate uh, Banking Committee, uh, what some good ideas to support might be. And you know, I relied on a lot of outside support. Uh, you know, I, I tended to rely on the more consumer-oriented uh, groups in, in thinking about what policies to put forward. But you know, I was I was lobbied, and you know, certainly there were a ton of banking lobbyists who would come in over and over again and tell us how we didn't know anything, and if we did this or that, the entire financial industry would would move to Singapore or London or something and you know, it would backfire. And you know, it's, it's very intimidating. Uh, and you know, I mean, I think the Dodd-Frank bill was, came out as a pretty good bill and there were some really smart people, particularly working in uh, Senator Dodd's and Congressman Frank's office. Uh, but you know, I, I, I saw firsthand just how overwhelmed uh, a Senate office was and how little expertise there there was on these you know really complex policy issues. Um, you know, so you know, I, after that, I, I you know kind of said, well, okay, this seems like a very straightforward solution that Congress should just invest in its own expertise. You know, as Kevin said, this is an institution that can set its own budget. So it really is a puzzle that Congress doesn't do that and we can talk about the reasons why and, and who who is helped but you know it, I think it's you know it, it's one of these things that is something that everybody knows and understands intuitively but I think what this volume really contributes and thanks to the hard work of Tim and Kevin and, and our many contributors you know and now now we have the the, the evidence <laughs> in in 17 meaty chapters so Thank you, Lee, and I appreciate your reference to evidence, especially as a law professor, uh, you know, and diving into what's uh, really what's behind some of this. I mean, and just to comment briefly on the impact of all that, and as someone who also served and for a much longer period of time on the Hill, there's a lot of discussion these days about the legislative branch needing to assert itself and the power of the executive branch growing and the role of lobbyists, which raises flags in lots of quarters. And the fact that there are serious issues with capacity and you identify empirically what that really means, you know, and, and get down into detail on it really does hamstring the legislative branch tremendously in its ability to do the job that it was designed to do. But that doesn't mean that job goes away. It shifts, it either shifts to the parties influencing the legislative branch or the executive branch plays a very substantial role and advises the ledge branch, or the judiciary has to step in and solve problems because it's very difficult at times for Congress to do it. And so I think it's an incredibly important subject to both understand, but also to think about what can we do about it because this issue has existed for a very long time. But I think the starting point, which is where you all started, 
is that there seems to be a very important capacity issue and a lot of it comes down to resources and staff resources where you all started is a big part of it. Um, in many of your chapters, you talk about what that shortfall and declining number of staff means. How is that emerging? How has that evolved? And what specifically is going on? And I thought it would be helpful uh, for you all to start by talking a little bit about what your findings were in the book um, and what it means, for example, that there is declining staff. How much has that changed? Why? Why are there few, fewer, fewer people? Um, and then we can also talk about why even the very good people that you know turn up on Capitol Hill don't typically stay. But if we could start with um, why the numbers uh, have gone down when they can design their own budgets and what they look like today versus what they used to be. Tim, maybe you can answer that initially yeah. and others jump in. Sure, I, I think that's that's the, 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 the key question here is that, that we need to understand partly the, um, the current status of Congress's capacity to solve problems didn't happen in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. right? It is a consequence of our changing politics that I think we can trace back to uh, the 1970s and 1980s when uh, uh, Congress and the, the government itself really began shifting from a, uh, a, a mechanism for, uh, um, for, for developing solutions to problems towards an arena in which the parties uh, 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 debate their pet issues that they, they then run on. So partly uh, uh, the, the problem, or, or at least the political context in which Congress finds, finds itself is this era of polarization, which we, are, we can well recognize. Right? The parties have drifted further and further apart. Um, and within the parties, members have become uh, uh, more uh, 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 ideologically consistent, although of course both parties are still uh, collections of different factions. What also has happened in this in this time period, and Francis Lee from the University of Maryland makes this this point uh, best, I think, is that not only have the parties drifted further apart, but party leaders have taken on the role of constantly competing in the next election. The next election begins the day after the last election. And when you have a Congress whose party leaders are now uh, uh, seem to be responsible for gaining or maintaining their majority status above all else, well then solving problems becomes secondary. The consequence of that setting is that uh, is, is twofold. One, because of it's been it's been such a long uh, period of time, and this has changed gradually through attrition. As members of Congress have retired or lost a reelection, um, that were accustomed to a Congress that was designed to solve problems, were then replaced by both Republicans and Democrats, who were then socialized in an institution where their job was to get on table cable TV news and to uh, uh, develop a healthy a robust social media presence, and uh, um, there's still only 24 hours in a day. So the, the consequence of this context, what, what has happened along the way is that Congress's legislating weeks are fewer and further between. The days in which they are physically present at the Capitol in order to do this kind of work, uh, um, even pre-pandemic uh, and, and uh, uh, pre-insurrection, uh, um, that uh, uh, you know, legislating in uh, two and a half days a, a week in Washington, when probably half of that time is, is spent dialing for dollars across the street at the DNC or the RNC, uh, means there's very little room left to develop policy portfolios, for members to develop policy specialization and expertise and learn the technocratic uh, language that goes along with many of these programs. And if they're doing that less, if that's becoming less and less of a priority, members have uh, shifted their resources away from this kind of policymaking, oversight, and lawmaking mechanisms towards communicating with, with constituents and communicating uh, partisan priorities, all of which is important, but that shift is something that happened uh, very, very slowly. And ultimately the consequence then is, now you have members of Congress who uh, um, who begin their career on, on Capitol Hill, they, they take what their, uh, their, their office budget in the House is known as the mem Members Representational Allowance as a given. Um, 
but there is very, very little introspection about where does that money come from and what is it intended to be used for. Um, in fact, since 2013, they have not even changed the top line number of what that uh, of what that is. So, uh, uh, cost of living wise, there's been a steady steady decrease uh, be, because of that. So, which ultimately means that members have uh, have, have to increase their technological uh, capability. They have to increase their human resources capability um, with less and less. They have to do more with less. And I think that is um, a very good description of the drivers really behind the um, ignoring the importance of the resources, the support, the policy making side, because the focus and the attention has turned to communications and uh, politics to a substantial extent. Um, but at the same time, it has allowed a hollowing out of the capacity to get things done. And I want to turn to some other panelists here to talk about the implications of that, because one of the things I'll just throw in to think about, uh, which I think is sort of woven through what you all have written about, is that there is a frustration out in the public about the ineffectiveness of Congress. So while people may engage and react to and vote based on those communicating uh, members and messages and message bills, um, some major problems are not getting solved and keep getting pushed down the road. And while scholars have noted that legislation is still occurring and some important legislation does occur, the lights are mostly still on in the government, a lot of uh, acute needs don't get addressed and it ends up creating a backlash. And I think we're facing some of that backlash now. Um, I'd like to ask Kevin, to talk about what you know, what does that actually mean in terms of where the capacity has disappeared and diminished? You know, and Tim is talking about why they turned away from even paying attention to capacity. But what did we lose? What did we lose in terms of staffing levels, experience, and even some of the independent agencies um, that used to, or organizations or entities that used to help members of Congress and staff get things done? All of that, when the gaze turned away, shrank. What what happened? And what does it look like now? Sure, sure. Happy to address that. But if I just for a moment can uh, piggyback mm -hmm. off of something Tim mentioned, sure. he's absolutely right that the politics here are key. Um, the rising anti-government sentiment that's kind of 50s, 60s, and really started getting higher and higher led to a pressure on legislators to find ways to cut government. Now, cutting the executive branch is extremely difficult because there are always interest groups who will protect each and every program. I mean, Jonathan Rauch wrote a book back in the early 1990s called Demosclerosis about this phenomenon where even programs that are ineffective or flat out bad are hard to get rid of because there's an interest group that mobilizes. Now with the legislative branch, with Congress, good luck finding an interest group. You're not gonna find a bunch of deep pocketed K Street lobbyists who say, we need more money for congressional staff, and we're going to lobby Congress to do that. We're going to contribute to their campaign war chests over that. It doesn't happen. So there's a, diff there's a inequality in the political dynamics, which has driven pressure away from co cutting government as a whole, from tackling real problems like entitlements and all that sort of stuff that actually need to be faced in a rational way to like picking on the legislative branch and nickel and diming it. And the effects, to get to your question, have been across the board. You know, we have, on the whole, few, fewer legislative branch uh, staffers to serve Congress than we did 40 years ago. Uh, the problem is particularly acute in the House. Um, the number of committee staffers, mind you, committees were supposed to be the places where policymaking gets done and oversight gets done. In the House, that number has gone down. Legislative branch support agencies, my old agency, Congressional Research Service, the GAO, uh, CBO, um, the late great uh, technology assessment agency. Staffing's all gone down there. Uh, CRS, for example, in the 1980s, they had 900 staffers. Now, mind you, this was early computer era and some of those were typists, but nonetheless, if you talk to anybody who worked there in the 80s, they will tell you that they had way more capacity to support Congress. And, you know, Tim's alluded to it. Government's gotten bigger. Policy has gotten way more complex. The demands upon 
the national government in general have just gone up and up and up uh, in part through interest groups, which is something Lee can talk about. And meanwhile, congressional Congress's people power, the folks who can actually deal with this has contracted. And as the data show uh, in the book, the staff who are there in Congress to deal with it, a lot of them have not been on the Hill very long. Uh, and a lot of them are not planning to stick around very long because the working conditions are not great. The compensation is not adequate. It's gone down in effective purchasing power over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, it's, it's a bad situation. Escalating demands, declining capacity. With that, I'll stop and pitch the ball to Lee. Yeah, and Lee, um, let me frame a question for you as well, which uh, just turning to the interest group issue for a minute and how that relates to the staffing issue. Could you touch on the fact that, you know, we've so we've identified the shrinking staff, shrinking resources, and it's much harder for staff to serve the members um, on a substantive basis and without help. And so where do they turn for help? Special interests frequently, um, NGOs, uh, lobbyists, where staff can go and say, well, what do you think we should do about something? Um, and I'm interested, and there's a motivation, I think, frankly, uh, as people are raising money and trying to please interest groups and get reelected, you know, there's, it's not necessarily something that members react so negatively to, you know, they want to respond to the interest groups. So having independent staffers scrutinizing the special interest information they're getting, I don't know if they're even that incentivized to do that. What's your take on the role of the shrinking staff and how it's affected the impact and power of special interests on the work of Congress? Yeah, well, that's a great point. Maybe members <laughs> aren't that interested in standing up to special interests, um, you know. But they do. They do take a lot of their direction um, and a lot of their ideas from from staff. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, look, I think there's a few ways to think about this. Um, you know, one is that what lobbyists do is they help members of Congress do things that they might already be inclined to do. Um, this is the lobbying as legislative subsidy uh, theory. Um, and, but, and, and so in that way, it seems, well, what's, what's the problem? The problem is that the lobbyists who exist overwhelmingly represent uh, a handful of very large companies and industries. And so if members of Congress are looking to do something because you know, they want to accomplish something, uh, they're, they're going to need a subsidy uh, to help them develop policy, to help them build a coalition, to help them you know, think through the legislative drafting. Uh, and so not, not everybody, not all the interests can offer the subsidy equally. You know, so I think sometimes when we think about lobbying and interest groups, you know, we kind of lump together a lot under under that label, um, you know, but there's, you know, everybody has a lobbyist in Washington, D.C., um, but not everybody has 50 lobbyists or 100 lobbyists, and having 50 or 100 lobbyists makes a big difference because uh, that means that you can help actually get bills uh, passed and you can reach out to all the congressional offices and find your allies. So, uh, you know, that's that's one factor is the the, the kind of subsidy factor. Um, the second factor is you know what, what I might call the bullshit detector factor, um, which is that if you're a rookie staffer and you're trying to bring ideas to your boss to look good, you know you might bring whatever. If you're a veteran staffer who's you know seen things a few times, you. And has some policy expertise, you know. You know what's a good idea, and you know what's a bad idea. Uh, so, you, know, you you're not wasting your, your your boss's time, and you're not bringing bad ideas forward. And you can push back and ask questions to the lobbyists, and you know, make sure that they're not trying to sell you something that's really bad policy. Uh, so, so, so that matters as well. Um, you know, and I mean another. Another, I think, underrated aspect of congressional 
capacity and you know staff staying on for a while and having expertise is this is a relationship among different staffers uh, and the networks that staffers build to to be able to to get stuff done, uh, which you know is goes beyond individual members. Uh, but there's a there's a kind of staffer level cadre that you know frankly you know if, if you're in it for the long haul you care about making the policy work and you care about uh, doing something that that's going to last and you have the networks and the people who you can kind of bounce ideas off of uh, both to, to kind of help you to you know weed out the, the BS um, and you know also develop ideas that maybe lobbyists aren't supplying um, you know but but that goes away. Uh, when you have this steady churn of staffers um, who are you know, in it for a year or two, it's an interesting experience. Maybe you get to work on a bill, and then it's you know off to law school, or off to K Street, or off to something else. Right? There's not the same investment in the in the networks in the in the policy, as well as you know the lack of of general experience and knowledge. So. You know, and then, and then additionally, to the extent that there are a number of staffers who are interested in having lobbying jobs after, which is something that we find in the, in the book and in the, in the surveys, you know, like their their goals are to maintain goodwill with future employers. Uh, so you know, they, they may carry water for for a certain interest that they want to go work for later. So you know, uh, all of this is a, is a tremendous problem for the ability of Congress to do big, complicated things that take a, a lot of expertise, a lot of knowledge, uh, and, and a lot of dedication, frankly. Let me um, take that then to sort of the next follow on point, you know, uh, listening to what you all are saying, which is okay, so you've done an excellent job identifying this problem and crystallizing what it is, and you've you've dug into, uh, and it's not just a matter of not enough staff, there's a lot of other factors to this that have to do with experience level and where they're placed in the organization, committee, personal office, et cetera. So you've done a good job and you've started to define that problem. What, you know, the next step is what could make it better? What is really needed? You know, you started the book by saying, you can't just add water, add dollars, fill the place up with staff, sort of willy nilly, that's not gonna be targeted enough and we don't need to spend all that money. We need to focus on a certain way of improving the situation on the Hill in terms of capacity. Could you all comment on, um, maybe I'll go back to Lee uh, or actually back to Tim at this point, just to kind of go back around again. Uh, so, what, so what do you do about this? Um, what would be the best place to try to come up, to go about reforming or changing. I mean, even if you just describe how you would change it, then we can talk about whether it's possible. <laughs> but what would you do? Yeah, that, that's right. Well, there, there's. I would say that there's an, a number of avenues to take, and I, and I think it starts with trying to recognize precisely what the organizational problems are. I mean, let's let's imagine an analogy here: a Fortune 500 company that does not have a centralized human resources. Uh, uh, department um, in which uh, every you know sort of local line manager can hire and fire anyone as they please and individual employees are given essentially no incentives to uh, uh, to develop themselves professionally to advance themselves within the organization and so forth and so on the CEO of that fortune 500 company would have been fired yesterday but Congress doesn't work that way. Uh, and Kevin touched on this in the very beginning, and that's underlying all of this is a fundamental collective action problem. Uh, Congress's capacity is a collective action failure. No one individual member of Congress can simply solve the problem by you know, raising her staff's salary by 20%. That would be great for that office, but, it's, but we have to recognize that organizational capacity means recognizing that employees, prospective employees, are part of a much larger labor market that ranges from lobbying to uh, the, the, uh, the executive and uh, uh, law firm, you know, PR firm, what have you. Um, so, so that's one way that, that there one step towards this, uh, towards solving some of these problems would be, I, I think, uh, uh, some kind of mechanism that would centralize 
uh, um, at least how we go about uh, um, trying to recruit good talent, right? Because we, uh, I'll, I'll reiterate the fact that the individual people who work on Capitol Hill are very hardworking, are very smart, are highly motivated by for, for very good, you know, common good and public good reasons. Um, but it, we, we can't blame them at an individual level for after a few years realizing that, well, I'm not going to be able to pay the mortgage. I'm not going to be able to raise my kids if I if I stick uh, with this with, with this lifestyle of earning uh, so relatively little, little, and in many cases being forced to uh, use a, a health insurance exchange in a very costly. Right. So, um, another aspect of this then w w that would be the one problem at, at sort of a, a collective level trying to uh, have a broader strategy um, that would address many of these needs. And that would include, by the way, uh, uh, um, people of color who are significantly underrepresented among staff and, uh, um, and, and recognizing that descriptive representation and that those experiences, life experiences, are, are as important as what degree you have um, and, and, and the connection you might have to an individual member of Congress. At the, at the individual office level, I would say we also, uh, if you were to look at this from a microeconomics perspective, that what is the benchmark for a well-functioning good office? There's one, the election. If you look at companies, they have quarterly earnings reports, stock price, productivity metrics, uh, um, and, and, and any number of ways to analyze whether or not the organization is achieving its mission. In the United States Congress, there's nothing like that, right? So um, what would it be like if there were professional development uh, 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 rewards for individual staff, or perhaps even uh, uh, um, resources, additional resources for offices that you know try to experiment with with new ways of, of functioning and new ways of, uh, uh, of producing the results especially if that was to move away from the existing political incentives of hiring communication staff uh, to do uh, uh, to do really good tweets. so if, if if individual members and committees were to be able to, to, to sort of, uh, uh, um, see react to a different incentive structure that would uh, direct them to doing uh, uh, things that we envision as being much more productive in overseeing this growing and complex federal government, uh, um, uh, investigating problems in society and the economy, and, and, and working uh, on, on much more even par with the White House and the massive uh, uh, Office of Management and Budget that is highly sophisticated relative to Congress, then I, I think um, those are things that are not so large and unimaginable reforms, such as you know things like doubling the uh, uh, legislative branch appropriations, right? So that we can, we, there are many things that can be done incrementally. What that would, uh, the the, the trade-off, however, would be members of Congress would have to recognize that maybe they they ought not have so much autonomy over spending taxpayers' dollars in order to achieve their political communication goals. Maybe they have to uh, uh, recognize that everybody would be better off if, if we could somehow create incentives for them to do more oversight and lawmaking. I think those are, um, that leads I think to another question and uh, those points I think are very well made. And Kevin, I would, I wanna to turn to you and ask about the politics of fixing the problem. Um, and Tim has talked about incremental changes uh, and that is a good place to start uh, for sure. It's interesting because in your book, you talk about how there may be a perception that a member can get beaten up for investing in staff or spending money in their office. And some you know, will advertise the fact that they sent money back to the treasury, et cetera, but it may in fact not be as uh, polarizing or lightning rod an issue to take care of the staff and do some things to improve conditions and in particular uh, to build what may be some of the most important group of staff, which is uh, people that you invest in over time who have experience and expertise. And um, you may not even need a ton of money to address that. You just have to create better working conditions, you know, benefits and issues that could really make a difference to retain those best staff. But 
Can you address for a moment the issue of how do we deal with this in light of politics? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the book has a chapter by uh, uh, Professor Tony Madonna and Professor uh, Ian Ostrander um, <clears throat> with a funny title that involves the words swinging dead cats. And, uh, you know, it takes a look at the issue of how um, Congress polls and in particular, when it comes to the idea of them spending more money on staff. And you know, the findings are really nuanced and the nuance is kind of lost, I think, on Capitol Hill. Uh, to put matters really crudely, you know, if members of Congress were to collectively vote to raise their own pay and also hire more individual staff for themselves, and this was publicized broadly in America, and it was just put out there, without any sort of explanation, the people might not react well to that. They might wonder, why do you need more staff? We thought you had enough staff already. That's one extreme. The other end is what happens if you hire more staff for the legislative branch support agencies who don't work directly for you an individual member of Congress. They're not going to drive you around in your car. They're not going to fetch your laundry. They're not going to write bills for you. They're going to do a lot of the things uh, that your staff as a member would do. That's completely different. There's no evidence whatsoever that spending money on ledge branch staffers or strengthening committee staff is going to lead to some sort of political backlash. The data just aren't, aren't there. Um, and then there's also the matter of, of framing. You know, it's one thing to have a message put out there that, yeah, we just decided to spend more money, you know, on ourselves. It's another thing to say, we're not serving you as well as we can. We don't have the best people in here. So like any organization that wants to perform better, we're going to spend a little more money. We're going to invest in getting better people to better serve you, the American voter. That's a completely different framework, you know, constituents don't like sending a message into their member of Congress and then weeks go by without getting a response or they get some sort of form letter. You know, they want a custom responsive answer. That makes all the difference in the world. But you can't do that if you don't have enough people, if you don't have the right systems. And this kind of gets me to the bigger point on congressional capacity is that we've talked a lot about people and people are so essential. Great people can make a grip for a great organization. But as we point out in the book, capacity is a broad term. It encompasses rules for running the House and the Senate, the tools that are available to legislators and staff to do their work, including technology, the internal organization and structures, uh, and of course money. It, these are a lot of things. And Congress, if it wants to reform itself, it can pick any one of those paths. And for the most part, the American public is fine with it. If you want to change the jurisdiction of a committee, for example, in the House, you're not going to have people, you know, getting up in arms and voting you out about that. Nobody cares, in which case they don't have to worry about that and they have all sorts of room to maneuver. And, you know, the best development on that count is that Congress has had for the last two years and will have for at least another two years, the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress, which has been diligently beavering away at problems small and problems large about Congress's rules, tools, people, and internal organization. Well, and hopefully uh, some of those recommendations uh, will uh, take flight, get traction, and some of them are on the very points we've talked about. Um, and I know uh, some of the folks who are participating in this program have asked some questions, and I wanted to throw those out there, a couple of those, um, one of which is that there was a mention about how Congress is not, and congressional staff is not very representative of the population at large in this country. And a question was asked about, you know, efforts made to make a difference on that issue and whether that issue in and of itself is limiting the vision and capacity and uh, ability of Congress to address uh, issues. And I don't know, Lee, if you could talk about that a bit. Uh, because one of the folks here was interested in hearing more about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a, a, a certainly a very important concern. And, you know, I, I think it's something that 
Congress has been a little more attentive to recently, um, probably uh, not nearly enough, uh, you know, but I, I think it, you know, there, there's been some encouraging progress. There was a, a pay our interns campaign that has gotten Congress to start paying interns because a lot of people get their first job in Congress through an internship. And if it's an unpaid internship, well, who can take on unpaid internship? People whose mommy and daddies have, have a lot of money who can, you know, pay their, pay their rent while they take an unpaid internship. Uh, so, you know, so it's, it's about you know, the pipeline. Uh, it's about getting people of all backgrounds into Congress in the first place. Um, you know, and I think ultimately, uh, you know, paying more staff and paying staff better uh, means that more people from more diverse backgrounds can work in Congress because even, you know, even at a paying level, I mean, Congress is still paying very low wages uh, for, you know, most positions until you really get to be chief of staff. Uh, and, you know, it's for, for somebody with student debt or somebody, you know, who has parents they need to support or, or other family that they need to support. Uh, you know, th that's th working for Congress is just not a, a financially wise decision for a lot of people. And that has to change. Uh, I mean, I think Congress can do more also to try to recruit beyond the, the traditional networks. Um, and you know, look to look to try to get staffers who look, you know, more like more like their districts and more like America. That makes a lot of sense. And go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I, I think if I can add to this, uh, um, I, I, all of the points that that Lee made are, are are well taken. And I think one solution to this problem would be again to look at best practices elsewhere, um, organizations uh, that succeed in. Uh, recruiting uh, diverse and inclusive uh, staff do so with very uh, intentional policies that are typically only effective when they are centralized and prioritized. Right now, the, the Congress of the United States, uh, again, is, is 535 small uh, uh, offices and uh, nearly 50 uh, committees, all of which have their own budgets and all of which make their own hiring and firing decisions. And for, for a lot of reason, that's, that is, that there, there's good reason for that, that members of Congress ought to select staffers who are generally in partisan and are ideologically aligned uh, with them. Um, but the, the consequence of that is that staffers who represent, uh, come from uh, uh, mar marginalized categories in society are typically gonna be working for members um, who are, are, are black and brown. And that, uh, uh, so that limit, it, what, how staffers really advance in their career frequently is by moving between offices. So in a system where uh, um, staff are gonna be compartmentalized, then, then their uh, ability to move between offices or up the so-called congressional ladder is, is very limited. So, um, and so, so I think what, uh, what can, one thing that ought to be paid a little bit more attention to would be for members to recognize uh, and, and, and to have a, a, a centralized strategic plan about what does it mean when we hire a legislative assistant? What does it mean when we hire a professional staff member at, at, at a committee? Those job titles currently have very little common definitions between offices and they're effectively useless, yet they, are, they remain the only benchmark to compare across offices. And, uh, um, and, and so when you have this system where there is no systematic attention being played to diversity and inclusion, that they're going to be, uh, that is going to become secondary. Another thing I wanna point out here though, is from, uh, not in, in our book, uh, unfortunately, but uh, um, sociologist James Jones at, at uh, Rutgers Newark is uh, coming out with a book called The Last Plantation, which is very much recognizing the problem that um, most black, brown and black folks who work on Capitol Hill wear blue shirts and work for uh, the architect of the Capitol, and which means that they are, are working in the, the service industry that, that, it, that underlies the restaurants and the, uh, uh, the many service organizations that are there for, for, for uh, staff and members. Uh, um, 
but then the, the the folks that work in the committees and and in party leadership offices are predominantly white and predominantly male, and uh, and and they probably overcome what what exactly what Lee is pointing out. The, the, the entry into working on Capitol Hill is often an unpaid internship, and often those unpaid internships are after the the, the person has earned a degree. Right? That that we have to recognize that these are not educational in any way, right? And and that they are simply. Uh, um, folks who are trying to get a foot in the door and are willing to do it part time, you know, work, work on the side and, and, and uh, in, in order to survive and get to that point where they have a paid position. And that's just not a viable long term strategy. And so, so if, we, if, if, if members are very serious about uh, a, a diversity and inclusion uh, on Capitol Hill, they, they need serious solutions uh, um, to, to that, that are going to more directly address that. And I think overall improve the quality of uh, of the capacity of the legislative branch. Let me add something to uh, just from the perspective of some of the work we do at American University. We have a professional development uh, program that we do on Capitol Hill, and we also do it uh, in an executive education program on legislative negotiation. And in the private sector, negotiation is something that people sign up for courses and they study it and they improve and refine their skills. And, and that's one example of a skill set that's very relevant negotiation skills to Capitol Hill. There are many others. But um, there's a lot of interest and we often hear from folks on the Hill about limits on opportunity for professional development. You were talking about the comparison to private industry. But I think that's yet another way that we could strengthen the skill sets on the Hill and give people some more tools to work with, even very experienced people who know a lot about the work they do and have been there a long time, you know, senior executives go and take these kinds of trainings and, and take things to another level. And I think that um, particularly given that one of the findings in your book was that very experienced staff uh, who have a specialized knowledge contribute markedly to outcomes on the Hill. And I would only add from my experience that I have seen that. And in fact, we hired many fewer staff at higher rates of pay. And most of the staff, when I was staff director of the committee that I hired were 20 plus uh, year veterans who had moved bills before. And consequently, we moved major legislation, transportation, flood control, uh, and other things, uh, even did a five-year transpo bill. But I, I say that and have tried not to jump in because your book is really the focus, but I think it actually was dovetailing perfectly with what you what you would have predicted, which is, um, and even with less money, everybody worked super hard and, you know, the workload is crazy on the Hill, but it's better to get that experienced staff who, and professional staff that invest for the long haul if we can get through the politics. I know we're in the last minute. Does anybody want to wrap um, with a final point? Well, then maybe I will just thank you all uh, for what I think is a really informative discussion and I hope just the first step in a longer discussion because this, uh, the work you've done is meaningful. I know having worked on the Hill uh, that it really hits the nail on the head as to some of the things that should be done to make a difference. Uh, and I hope that you all can continue to see that through. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you all so much. Really, uh, really appreciate all your comments. Thank you, Bettina, for a great job moderating and uh, thank you to all of our attendees. And uh, we will certainly have more information about our, our upcoming events. So thank you all again. Thank you. Great book. Highly recommend it. <laughs>